Hello, everybody. Thank you for that. Um, welcome to City Point Brooklyn. I'm Michaela. I am I'm on the events with Nally Jackson. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. We are so, so excited about this book, and we're so happy to see so many other people are just as excited. Um, before I do some introductions, I do want to thank yeah, City Point Brooklyn, which is the building where I'm for hosting us tonight. We are so happy working with them. We're so happy working with Brett's publishers at Knopf, so thank you, everyone. Okay, so by way of introduction, Brett, oh, the other thing I'll say is if you see an empty seat, please take it. You can see we're a full house tonight, so please try to shuffle in any way you can. Um, okay, so Brett Easton Ellis is the author of six novels, a collection of stories, and a work of nonfiction, which have been translated into 32 languages. He lives in Los Angeles and is the host of the Brett Easton Ellis podcast, which is available on Patreon. And we're so thrilled that he's in conversation tonight with Nomi Fry, who is a staff writer at The New Yorker, where she writes about popular culture, books, and art. She lives here in Brooklyn. Um, so yeah, everyone give it up again for these guys. Thanks. Uh, I'm good. How are you feeling? I'm feeling uh, fine. I'm feeling pretty good. We just had a nip of gin backstage. Oh, not so much like two sips. I mean, it was just something to get me on stage, but it's totally fine. Uh, it was no more than that. No more than a nip. But I am, I am a bit exhausted. Yeah, you got tour. in. You got in last night. Yeah, doing the doing the book tours, and so for I, I know like a lot of people out here. I'm probably not going to be able to see you afterwards. My my dear dear friend Amy, I see you over there. Dear, dear friend, I sound like Lydia Tarr, you know. <laughs> uh, and then Jason Starr is somewhere here. I thought I saw him, an excellent crime writer, is in the back row there. Jason, text me, please. Up. I'm just going to go back to my hotel and collapse. But anyway, it's been a really busy day. But anyway, I'm glad to be here in Brooklyn and to be talking to you. And um, yeah, it's all good. You know, Brad Ellis in Brooklyn? That sounds, you know, that's not the most natural sounding phrase in the world, but, yeah. yeah. When was the last time you were in Brooklyn, though, the last time you did a book tour in 2010? Uh, no, the, la <clears throat> the last time I've been in Brooklyn was uh, the 90s. <laughs> Excuse me, I saw, you, I saw you in Brooklyn in oh, 2010. Oh, right. you did see that's why. That's how I know he was in Brooklyn in 2010. You saw me in Brooklyn at a, at a reading in 2010, that's true, but before that, in the 90s. Right. And when a friend of mine said, I can't afford Manhattan anymore, I'm going to move to Brooklyn, and we all gasped. <laughs> said, well, what are you talking about? You can't move to Brooklyn. And then everybody did. I know, and look at us now. Yeah, um, it's incredible. incredible. <laughs> no, I mean, when I went to Brooklyn, it was right, uh, I forgot where it was, but I didn't get to see as much. It was it. at Book Court, oh, the yeah. Departed Book Court in yeah. Cobble Hill. Anyway, yeah. uh, but this is just, I, but I really haven't looked around uh, since then, and it's been enlightening. So it's been, so yeah, the last time you were in Brooklyn was when you had the book tour for Imperial Bedrooms, which was your last novel, which was 13 years ago. Yeah. So do you maybe want to take us um, over the past, 13 years in which you didn't write a novel. <laughs> no, just in the sense of like, um, how, why did you not write a novel over those years and how did you finally come to write this novel now? Um, because a novel finds you. Okay. Okay, the novel finds you. You don't find the novel. The novel comes to you. Uh, you don't sit around one day and go, gee, maybe I'll write a novel about uh, a serial killer on Wall Street or whatever, or maybe I'll write a book. It comes to you. You feel it. It's an emotional thing. Mm -hmm. It's not, you don't over-intellectualize it and you don't think about it too much. You're going through something that's a feeling. It's emotional. I'm confused. I'm in pain. Why am I feeling this way? What is wrong with my world? What's wrong with my life? And for me, it has always been, ever since Lesson Zero, a way, the novel has been a way for me to explore that, to solve it in a way, and mm -hmm. to heal it in a way. So I've always looked as, at writing as this um, thing that happens to me, no matter where I am in my life, that just happens to land at a particular time, and mm -hmm. then I write the book. It's never worked, any, it's never worked uh, in any other way. Uh, I've never been, you know, someone said, uh, 
you've got to write a novel, you're under contract. I'm never under contract to write a novel. Mm. I never I never do a contract unless I have a novel, I'm writing it, it's done. This was this novel was the same. I didn't take a contract until it was completely finished. And basically that's how it works. And at each stage in my life, um, I've gone through things that have confused me and upset me and hurt me and I've uh, been lost to a degree. And then the novel starts announcing itself and then I work through all that emotion while writing the novel. It's really basic. So and it's all I'm, bad emotion. Um, it well, like. it is. To a degree, it is negative emotion. It mm -hmm. could be unrequited love. Right. It could be like bad thoughts about my dad. It could be feeling extremely nostalgic and kind of negative and bad about being a senior in high school, which is what The Shards is about, where I did hurt people and where I did go through some things that at 57, 58, when I was working on the book, I kind of wanted to write about and, you know, uh, kind of explore that time and uh, it sounds kind of whatever, but the people that I loved. And I think as an older man who could never figure this book out because I've been trying to write the shards since I was 18. I first had the idea to write the shards in 1982. I interrupted the Less Than Zero project, which I'd been working on for about two years, and then the shards announced itself. And I said, oh, I really want to write the shards. I just didn't kind of have the chops to do it. It was way too narrative, and I just couldn't feel that this, these kind of symphonic movements of the book, right. at 18, I couldn't do it. But I could do Less Than Zero. I could do right. that book. So, um, so uh, but, and, but then finally the shards kind of opened itself up to me after years and years of trying, like at 26, 30, whatever, I write about it in the opening forward of the novel. There was just something that happened at 57, that it was not a novel that's going to be narrated by an 18-year-old. It's mm -hmm. a novel that's going to be narrated mm -hmm. by a 57-year-old man. Mm -hmm. And when I realized that, the door opened and it just all came flowing out. Was there like a kind of triggering event or particular period, like moment in your life where you were like, I can do this now? Since you've, you've been saying you've been trying to write this book, kind of can, since like 1982. Um, I, I can't say that there was, a, 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 triggering might not be quite the right word, right. but something happened mm -hmm. that, made it, that made this book finally announce itself to me. And it was basically, and I, you know, I talked to, uh, I had Quentin Tarantino on my podcast, and I was talking to him about, why do you make Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? And he said, well, I wanted to make a movie about my childhood, which it is. It's a mm -hmm. movie about the Manson family haunted me, I knew a lot of actors, we lived on the fringes of Hollywood, I loved movies, and, and to a degree, I think it happens with a lot of film artists, I think, you know, you look at Fellini with Armacord, you look at Ingmar Bergman with Fanny and Alexander, Aroma is a certain, uh, you know, uh, is another movie where an artist gets to a certain age and they just feel this need to go back to that part of their life and understand it right. and kind of clarify things that mm -hmm. happen. And basically this was true of the shards. I was just at that right moment. I was at the right age and it just was uh, the right time. And again, it was, I realized, a memory book. It wasn't a book how I originally thought of this book and tried to write it was in the style of Less Than Zero, which was minimalism. A 18-year-old first-person narrator and not giving you any of this backstory, not being able to look back on all of this stuff and just giving you the facts. And it just wasn't working until I realized Oh, it's that man that's narrating it, and he's right. looking back. And I, I, I think a lot of it was nostalgia for that period. We were, in, it was in lockdown, and I was just thinking a lot about um, that period for some reason, and those people that were so integral to my life at seventeen and eighteen. And they, I, I don't know why then they all mm. appeared, but they did appear, and they were just haunting me. And that. It was just one night in April, I was looking for a couple of classmates that I went to school with in 1982. Just online? Online, right. yeah. I, I hadn't ever done this before. I'm not really online that much. Mm -hmm. not, but, and so, I, so I looked at, on Facebook, which I'm never on. No, no, neither 
one of them were there, and these were like kind of two guys I was into, and then there was, a, you know, just students from, from that time. Nothing. There was no social media stuff going on. And then I also, that led me to look at the places uh, that we hung out in 1981, 82. Mm -hmm. uh, the nightclubs, the galleria, the movie theaters, the coffee shops, all gone, because they hadn't been curated. No one was curating the stuff like they were now. So that entire sense of history of that time was also erased. Couldn't find those classmates. There was nothing else to do in lockdown. So, you know, the wine was opened a little bit earlier and you were on YouTube and I was listening to like Blondie and whatever. And it all came flowing back. And one night, if you had asked me a week before I started the, char the Shards, were you going to write the Shards? I would have said, no, I tried that book so many times. And then within that week, one night, I said, okay, do you remember the movements of the book? Okay, you start at the party, then you're at the stables, then you go the first day of school, and then something happens to the statue, and then Robert Mallory, the new kid, appears. And then I, I remembered it, and I wrote down a very quick outline, and I, it all came rushing back, and the next day I had like 14 pages. So it came rushing back from your memories of what actually happened, or it came rushing back from your memory of the book that you have been trying to write over the course of these years, because obviously, you know, I listened to maybe the first half of the novel on the podcast, on your podcast, when you were reading it in I serialized session. the novel on the podcast for one year. It was year. serialized um, on Brett's podcast. It's still available, unedited. If anyone wants to go to Patreon, it's six bucks. It's 33 hours long. You can listen to that version. The, the Kanaf version is tighter. A little cleaner, and so if you. But it's quite. It's, it's 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 similar. It's very similar, as far as I can. A vibe, uh, maybe a vibe. Yeah, it's a yeah. vibe novel. Does it's I a vibe novel. novel. It's a vibe novel. Um, it's six hundred pages. Of course, it's a hangout novel. Well, yeah, it's a hangout novel. It's a vibe novel. It's a hangout novel where people <laughs> die violently. <laughs> no my, my favorite kind of vibe novel. <laughs> it's a vibe. Um, so I I listened to it, or I listened to some of it. I just. Um, Ultimately, I was like, I'm going to wait for the book because I emailed you and I was like, we need, is this going to be a book? And you were like, I'm not sure. I'm sort of writing it for myself because it didn't have a contract no. or anything. And in the, in the podcast, on the podcast, you were very insistent. And I know there are certain things that you took out later, like um, stuff about your, your sisters that you, you first put in there and then you ended up being an only child in the book and, and so on. But you were very insistent that this is what happened, right? You were like, this is God's truth, these are the things I experienced. And then, of course, in the novel form, that kind of uh, God, uh, I mean, I think there's even like a disclaimer at the beginning, right, of like all events, if I'm not mistaken. So there was this shift that happened, and I was wondering how you think about that now, um, and whether it matters or or not, or what's your attitude towards that? The sort of like early insistence on like this is all this is like literally a memoir versus this is a novel. Novels take a long time to write. Mm. They take a long time to write, and I spent eight years on a novel called Glamorous. So that novel for me was, first of all, pure pleasure to write. I didn't want to stop writing it because I had so much fun writing it and I loved living in this guy's voice. And it kind of changed over the years even though there was um, uh, an outline and all that stuff. And I, and I just loved talking about Victor Ward. I just thought it was just like so great to write about. Um, with, and, and that happens with books where you begin to uh, become intertwined with them in a way. Now, I, and, and, and you, you have to, as a writer, kind of believe them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying this method acting and that what you're writing about it really happened to you and that you can't take a break at cocktail hour but you're still in the book. No, that's not true. But you do live with the book and it does kind of overtake you in a way when you're working on it. With the shards, yes, there was a kind of shards-like project when I realized I was going to begin writing this book. And for anyone who used to follow me on Twitter, there is a tweet from 2013 the referencing classic this book. tweet. Robert Mallory is <laughs> not, a not that tweet, the other tweet from 2013. Oh, well, yeah, the, 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 
come home and bring me some coke or whatever it was. That, that was the last. But um, there was a tweet from 2013 about like Robert Ball. I, this is how long I've been thinking about the book. Robert Ball. My next novel is Robert Ballard is a serial killer and attends Buckley High in 1981 or whatever. Uh, so I've been thinking about this book again for 40 years. When it finally dropped into my lap in April of 2020, I began to realize that um, it was kind of, um, it was turning into a kind of project because I didn't plan on publishing it. I realized after writing 200 pages I was going to serialize this novel on my podcast. And I was going to present it as memoir and as the truth. This thing really happened to me. Fred Ellis is narrating this. These are all my friends. I'm going to give you my background. I'm the, I was working on, working on less than zero then, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is my story at 17 and 18. And I got to tell you, Noe, a lot of it is. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is. But, you know, people would ask me, what happened? Why are you writing this? And I said, well, this really horrible guy entered into my high school. Uh, in 1981, and his name was Robert Mallory, and he was this freak, whatever. And I was telling people this at dinners, and I was telling these people at cocktail parties and stuff, and I was pretending that what I was now recording was true. It was something that I just felt I wanted to do, I had to do. I really didn't care that it was, in fact, fiction. But uh, I, I did start doing this, and some people figured out uh, sooner than I thought that, no, it's not true because they couldn't find a Robert Mallory, they couldn't find these series of murders that happened, mm -hmm. especially the deaths of certain private school kids in 1982 <laughs> where not nowhere to be found. So, but it was something that I felt I needed to do and that I, and that I also thought, and this is a key thing about writing, was fun. Mm -hmm. It was really fun to do. It wasn't like some huge scam. I mean, I wasn't like stealing money from people. I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was doing what the young author in The Shards does, embellish. Mm -hmm. He embellishes. Now, The Shards is a warning about that. It's, it's the moment where you realize I have to see the world for how it is and not for how I want it to be. That was what was happening to me in 1982. Okay, well, I want this person to love me. I want this person to be that person. I really do want to be the boyfriend to that girlfriend. It's none of this is real. Mm -hmm. You've got to, you know, face up to that. And but I didn't then. I didn't, and so right. I caused a lot of problems my senior year. And some people didn't talk to me, and I made up stuff, and I was a fabulous and all that stuff. And so that's where the shards mm -hmm. came from. But I, I, I feel it was all part of the process that. That, that, that initial moment of pretending that the Shards was real. And people who are listening to the podcast, because the initial chapters are very autobiographical and almost grounded in a kind of journalism about Los Angeles in the early 80s and are very specific. It's about, extremely specific yeah. all throughout, yeah. And so I, and then I would intersperse these, uh, these, um, these episodes with, come, I would come back the next week and say, well, you know, I got some things wrong last episode. Uh, a friend I hadn't talked to uh, from Buckley, the school that all takes place at, uh, uh, emailed me and said, Tom Wright did not drive uh, a Datsun, he drove a white Corvette, and then I would incorporate that into it. And as with my sisters, I eliminated them from the book because I do have two sisters, the Brett Ellis and the Shards does not. I made up this very elaborate backstory how they never wanted me to mention them in the book again after being humiliated in Lesson Zero, as being the two sisters in the backseat of the car saying they stole my cocaine and talking about how they want a, a Galago video game, whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and, then I, and then I said that we're in a boarding school upstate, which was not true either. So it was just, it was all kind of like a project. It was fun for me. And how, you're talking about the kind of unreliability of yourself as a high school student and then about the unreliability of the narrator, of the Brett, who's the narrator of the Shards, and that kind of intersects in an interesting way with the crime novel aspect of, of, of this book, I think, because as in American Psycho and as in Imperial Bedrooms, for two examples, it's hard for the reader to know, obviously, what is fiction, what is, what is fantasy, but then also that leads to a kind of like messy noir or a kind of like busted noir or something, like in the sense of like, we don't really, you know, I mean, the thing about noir is that there's, it's, it's supposed to be airtight, right? 
And here, there's a kind of like diffuseness because we don't know exactly what to believe. Is that something that you think about at all? You know, the kind of like plot of like finishing up the serial killer thing and so on, vis-a-vis -vis the type of unreliability of, of the characters that you want to portray. But uh, well, first of all, my favorite noirs are not all tied up. Mm. Well, my favorite noir is um, The Long Goodbye um, mm. by Raymond Chandler, which is considered his kind of messiest novel. Right. And, and even his great novels, I don't even think Raymond Chandler knew how they tied up in a way. Right. It was a vibe. Mm -hmm. it was right, it's more of a vibe than a... It's the poetry of Raymond Chandler that yeah. you get into. It's really not, who cares about these? Who's did the, the, the killing or the end of the mystery. I mean, that really isn't what you're, it is the unreliability of those of those endings sometimes and of like the confusion surrounding mm -hmm. them that makes noir so interesting. And my favorite noirs kind of reflect that to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that there's something about an unreliable narrator that gives a book an un, just this undeniable tension. And it's something that I don't know if it was Nabokov or whatever I was reading in uh, in college, where I realized it was, maybe it was Pale Fire, or whatever. Was it was like this moment where like, that's fascinating. The narrator of the novel is not telling us the truth. This isn't Nick Carraway. This isn't whoever. This is this is someone who's actually telling us a version of the events that he wants us to think happened. And that really struck a nerve with me, and I've always liked playing with that idea because I think it gives the book, it's frustrating for some, they don't like it, mm -hmm. but I do think it gives the book a tension, this mm -hmm. through line tension, and I think there are moments, probably when you're reading The Shards, where you get to a point and you go, I don't know if he's reading this right. I right. don't think that's, and there, because it's, a long, it's a long book, there's probably many of those that you said, but I think, in the beginning, he makes such an effort at, this is the 57-year-old narrator again, making this huge obsessive effort. That's why all the detail, the names of the streets, all of this stuff is making such an effort for you to believe this because by a certain point you realize he is telling a version of the events and a version of this person he was obsessed with that simply isn't true. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a really interesting novel from Robert Bauer's point of view, right. that would be about someone having maybe four stalkers. I, I don't know what it right. would be, but so, but so I've always liked playing with that uh, the unreliable narrator is attention. And as for noir being so airtight, uh, the best noir, and and I tried to write a noir novel. Imperial Bedroom was completely influenced by um, Raymond Chandler during the the years that I wrote it. And I realized, well, the complications and the unanswered questions are part of the mystery and part of the noir. Yes, you get kind of enough, mm -hmm. but then you can ask another question, and that will lead you to two more questions, and on and on and on. Um, airtight fiction and airtight plots and airtight narratives don't interest me. I like something more expansive mm -hmm. and ranging. So that's just my thing, and I think and I think there's enough answered in the shards to a degree that will you'll get it. You'll get the thing. But there's there there are also questions. And I think one of the things that about American Psycho, for example, and why it's still talked about today, is that there's this 50-50 divide over did he do it or did he not do it? I guess I could have answered that and made it very clear in the book that he did commit the crimes, or he most definitely did not. But there was something so interesting to me when I was working on that book not to answer that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe you know one of the reasons why it's still talked about. I don't know. And what's so interesting, it's funny, a few nights ago I went to see um, Natural Born Killers uh, at Metrograph where you're going to be presenting American Gigolo tomorrow. And I haven't watched it since the 90s, and I was like, wow, this, I thought it really held up, and I thought it was, I was surprised to think it was really great. And I was like, okay, the 90s definitely were a time when we were all obsessed with serial killers, but we also, obviously, looking at America right now, you know, we're continued to be, continuing to be obsessed with <laughs> mass killing in, in a lot of different ways, and obviously, and has continued to be a source of inspiration to you um, 
across you know different novels and I was wondering uh, with this particular novel how you felt that it was germane to what the character the development of the character the, the plot that you weave around him um, his subjectivity um, and just the, to the world that you're portraying well look growing up in California in the late 60s and throughout the 70s serial killers were ubiquitous mm -hmm. they were everywhere there were two or three or four well-known ones crisscrossing each other all the time. It was just like the background wallpaper uh, in terms of the news. I mean, it was, it was something that you noticed and you grew up with. And really, if you're of a certain age, my age or Quentin Tarantino's age, and though not technically a serial killer, the notion of this cult, like the Manson uh, family, entering into your house one night and just killing all of you, two nights in a row or whatever, really haunted a generation myself included, and you know that's one of the reasons why Quentin Tarantino wanted to make that movie, and why I have been interested in serial killers uh, throughout my career to a degree. And I have written scripts, one or two of them I think made, uh, about that, and then they have been in mostly, well, uh, American Psycho is a New York novel, but in the, in the LA novels there always seems to be serial killers lurk in the background, even in a collection like The Informers, there's something going on in almost all of those 13 stories that seem connected to the same serial killer. Certainly that's true in Imperial Bedrooms. And there is even references to one, I, I believe in Less Than Zero, though play things is like a weird whatever. Yeah. And so I, I just think it's just something that affected me. It was so impactful to me growing up with this notion of these, you know, these people doing these things that it has never left me. Mm -hmm. And there was something, if I was going to write about 1981, 1982, that was definitely going to have to be part of it. But that was, when I was thinking about this book in 1981, 1982, that was there. It was, again, integral to the notion of <clears throat> imagination of linking things as a writer to other things that maybe should not be linked this notion of hearing things that aren't there, that the bread in the book is constantly referencing, that other people are noticing about him. The Shards to me is all about a young writer uh, moving from adolescence into adulthood, whatever, from innocence into corruption, whatever you want to say, and who's also a writer and realizing that he has to uh, control this uh, superpower or whatever, the origin story. Know, that he's learned this horrible mistake he makes and then moves onward from that with some new sense of knowledge about how to use this, this talent. Right. Um, I think we, I'm, I was, I'm receiving word that we should move to some questions from the audience that were given to me in advance. Um, okay. Uh, this is a question, let's see, from Michael Chin. Uh, when the character Brett writes Less Than Zero in the Shards, was he writing Clay and Blair's relationship based on a version of himself and, and Debbie, himself and Susan, Tom and Susan, or was it unconnected to the characters in the Shards? You know, I, I think a lot about the Californians, that SNL skit. I think about a lot when I hear a question like that, and also in some of the reviews, of, some of the reviews of the shards reference the Californians. Whenever a character says, "No, do you want to take Beverly Glenn to Wilshire?" And, take Wilshire to and some uh, reviews have pointed out that literally there are maybe 70 pages of directions that sound exactly like something uh, out of the, the Californias. Now, I just happen to think that's really true. That is how people talk. No, you take the 410 to the 10, and then you take the PCH to, you know, whatever state. Um, but um, all of this stuff that this guy's asking me, Mr. Chin, wherever you are, um, he's, what he's referring to is that the Brett in the shards is writing less than zero. And I refer to it as less than zero. And I was writing less than zero in 1981-82. And in less than, and I talk about in the shards how I um, took a break from working on less than zero because all these horrible things were happening. All these horrible things were happening that made me then want to write the shards 
And then he also missed, but I couldn't do it. So I went back to zero. In the shards, Brett has a girlfriend uh, named Debbie. And Debbie is, has a lot of similarities to the Blair character from Less Than Zero. And uh, so whoever asked that question, you are uh, correct in assuming that a lot of what I was referring to in Less Than Zero does come from not only that period, but what I really, really flush out in the shards. Now, I haven't talked to the girl that I, I got, I got a, she doesn't have my number or whatever, but and I haven't talked to her for over 30 years, but last week I got like a Facebook message or something that simply said, I didn't even see the name first, that simply said, of all the names you could have used, you had to use Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> and it was sort of like, oh yeah, and then I wrote I like that that's her quibble. Uh, well, <laughs> well, well, no, you know, part of what I wanted to do when I was writing the shorts, and I am writing about, I mean, they'll know. You know, they'll know. But I also, but this all went through legal with Knopf, so there's nothing. I actually think it's, it is more often than not, I mean, the real problem in the book is Brett. The real problem is Brett. I really do think I kind of lovingly depict Debbie and uh, a character named Matt Kellner and a character named Tom Wright and, you know, Susan Reynolds, certainly, who was the girl that, despite whatever my proclivities were, ended up being, I was in love with her. She was like the most beautiful girl in school. My girlfriend at that time was also extremely popular, uh, the girl based somewhat on Debbie Schaefer. So I, it was, I wanted to go back there, I wanted to write about these people, and I also wanted to clarify maybe some of the things that I omitted and did not address in Less Than Zero. Basically that I really cared for these people. Right. You know, and this kind of idea of, I, I got knocked a, a, a couple places, a couple friends of mine said, oh, you're really into the new sincerity, aren't you? This is the new Brett who's being super <laughs> sincere. How boring. Why don't you just, you know, where's the old Brett that, you know? But, you know, you get older. You age out of shit. So whatever, I wanted to write this book regardless of whatever anyone thought about it. But, um, uh, yeah, that's a really long answer for a fairly basic question. So, that's all. Okay. Uh, no, I think that was very satisfying. Um, let's move on to a, a different question from... Angelina Houston, uh, who asks, could you talk a little bit about the rules of attraction, the book, and how it stands apart from the rest of your books? Uh, I don't think it stands apart from the rest of my books because the, the books are, you know, someone asked me, uh, I'm interrupting them, I'm asking, someone asked me, why have you written a full on memoir? Not something like White, which is a cultural examination of Gen X and about a bunch of other stuff. That wasn't a full on memoir. Why don't you write a memoir? And I, have, I tell people, I already have. There's, there's nine of them. There's eight or nine of them. The, that's my memoir, starting from Lesson Zero all the way to the Shars. That, that I am telling you exactly where I was, what I was going through, my breakdowns, my obsessions, my whatever. And so I look at all of the books uh, in, in that way. And so I don't necessarily see Rules of Fraction as that different from the, over, from the eight or nine books that I wrote. Um, that I published, um, but the rule of attraction is in some in some strange way. It's like the one book of mine that has like a constant like four stars on Amazon or whatever. It doesn't have the five star, one star, five star, one star, five star, one star. It really has a steady three and a half to four to a four and a half star. People seem to like that overall the best. They're not as passionate about it as say American Psycho or Glamorama. But that just seems to be the book that people really feel like. I wonder if it's because like it's a, it's a college novel, and it's like it, it's people can sort of identify with it more readily than they could with say a teenager in LA and an, I mean of course it's upper middle class and so on, but it just seems like maybe a little bit more universal so called than your other books. I think more people identify with Patrick Bateman than anything. <laughs> Want to see what happens at Halloween? I mean, I mean, I, I, the memes, the whatever I see. I mean, I think Patrick Bateman is the most. I uh, people identify with him the most, and not the kids from the Rules of Attraction. I think they just like that book. Again, the Rules of Attraction is a book that I like. I like a, I like a hangout, novel. and I know that's hard to understand. Where you're just you're put into this world, and you know, Lesson Zero doesn't really have a plot or something that kicks in. But you're in this world, and you're going to the park,
parties with the kids, and you're in the car, and then you know they're driving along sunset, and someone does some poke or whatever. I just this like world building. I like that kind of rangy novel. And you know, I'm getting I'm getting taken to task in some reviews for the shards being too long. Good. I wanted it to be this long. I, I, I this was not supposed to be a tight thriller, though some people grab onto that aspect and read it that way. But I wanted it to be a hangout novel, a vibe novel. So mm -hmm. I like that. And, and I think Rules with Franklin is certainly yeah. that. And also, it like every other novel I published, it was about something major that was happening to me, and that was unrequited love. What yeah. do you do with that? And I, the only way that I could figure that out was to, and work my way through that, was to write a novel. Yeah. Um, OK, another question from Tom Rankin. One of my favorite books of yours is Lunar Park, and I know that writing it was very helpful for you as far as wrapping up issues you had with your father. The last five pages or so are particularly moving for me as a reader. Can you talk about that a bit? And since this is another novel about your past, and another novel where you're the main character, did you find that writing the shards helped you, again, bring closure to end? Okay, completely. 100% both instances. The shards, I've been haunted by three or four characters from my actual high school years that I just could not get rid of. And I was thinking more and more and more about them. And that they were just haunting me. And, and haunting me to such a degree that the shards of this novel that I was thinking about since 1982 came back and started, it started entering into my office and started entering into my thoughts. And I would start thinking about these people I don't know why, maybe I'm old, 57, they, these, high, these people from high school came back to me. And so it was a huge, to talk, to write about the guys I based, Ryan Vaughn and Matt Kellner and Debbie Schaefer and Susan Reynolds and Tom Wright, these are the main characters of the Shards. A huge feelings of just like relief and like I'm finally getting it out and like, I really cared about you guys, and I'm sorry that I was such a dick, and I loved you, and all that stuff. And that's, and that's true with what happened with Lunar Park, which a lot of it was about these unresolved feelings I had with my father, who was an extremely problematic parent. You know, I, I, I understand him now at 57 so much better than I did in my 20s, or my 30s, or my 40s. I totally get why he was the way he was. I completely forgive him, and I completely understand him. And part of that process had to do with, with writing Lunar Park, which was kind of me imagining being a dad, and then my dad kind of haunting me, and this kind of this, whatever, metaphysical haunted house story. And it does end with this thing that uh, the last four or five pages, which I, I admit I worked on for a long time. I was writing those four or five pages where I, you know, the cliched scene of releasing the ashes in the air, and, sad music plays or whatever. And, um, and this happened. When I wrote that, I was in my, I was in the house that I grew up in. Um, and I wrote that, it, a physical pressure entered into my body and then left. And then I was kind of teary-eyed and sad and never looked back. That's kind of what writing does for me. I, not that it, it sounds sappy that it's, well, it sounds like so therapy ridden and all that. It's not that because it really is just about my relationship with these problems and putting them on the page. I don't want to force my therapy on you. I don't want you to have to like go through my, my sessions or whatever. But um, whoever asked that question, for, in both cases, the shards and uh, Lunar Park, yes. And I also have to say the rules of attraction as well. Definitely. It happens all the time. Yeah. So, uh, and with the shards, do you feel too that a weight has been lifted? Completely. Similarly. Completely. Yeah. I felt yes uh, for a couple of reasons. One of them was that that world is gone. It's disappeared. It wasn't curated. It wasn't curated the way things are now. And when that month in April of 2020, when the shards kept coming back to me, and the guy was Matt Kellner and Ryan Vaughn and Susan Reynolds were suddenly coming back to me. I really looked for the places we hung out, whether it was the Galleria doesn't exist anymore, movie theaters we went to, nightclubs, coffee shops, 
all gone. They were not curated, they were not photographed, there's very, very little physical presence of them online. And that s sparked a whole other wave of nostalgia that pushed me closer to writing, writing the book. So how did you how did you recover that? I mean, practically speaking, this is just a question for me, not the values. In terms of like you even talk about the menu, the typeface of the menu of, of certain, you know, like Morton's or whatever, I forget what it is. Um, and exactly about where things are located and what they look like and the fabric on the did you do a lot of did you just remember? Did you do a lot of research? And what about the stuff that isn't available since it wasn't, as you say, curated. You, you know, the end of the book, there's this kind of afterward. Um, I'm not spoiling anything, whatever. There's an afterward where the writer, uh, Brett, talks about why he wanted to tell this story. And it's true. It wasn't, he says, because of its most dangerous, eerier, uh, eeriest element, the trawler, which is the serial killer that is haunting LA at the time. And Brett believes is coming after him and his friends, and maybe even killed one of his friends. It wasn't about that. What he wants to write about was the way Matt Kellner smelled after, mm -hmm. the pool, after being in the pool, how Susan Reynolds' numbness, her beautiful numbness, influenced his style, for example. I wanted to write about these restaurants and this world. It was kind of this Proustian moment for me where I'm going to write about the LA that I remember, and you know, I, I'm really gonna detail it and it's going to be kind of a historical book in a way, and not necessarily, you know, a very tightly knit connected dots thriller. Mm -hmm. So um, that aspect kind of does overtake the book, but so much of it was about uh, remembrance and all of those places and wanting to get them down on paper uh, because they just meant so much to me. I mean, as everything does when you're, when you're that age or so. Okay, I have time for one last question, so we're going to do a maybe a quick one. This question is from, uh, from Harry Hill. Uh, Brett, if you could have dinner with any of your characters, who would you choose? And would that answer change if you were meeting for lunch? <laughs> This presupposes that everyone knows all the characters uh, from my work. Well, probably but, um, a, lot of, a lot of us right, know. Right, so it would be characters. a character <clears throat> for, din for lunch, which is a more innocent meal than dinner is, because dinner suggests something can happen after dinner. Um, I always prefer things happening before dinner, but that's you know, whatever. Um, a character, the character that I would most like to have uh, Dinner with well, you know, it's usually people from the latest book, you know. So mm -hmm. I would say the person that I would most like to have dinner with is the Tom Wright character from The Shards. Okay. I still am haunted by this guy, and I wrote about him lovingly in this. Uh, this person hasn't spoken to me in forty years, but whatever, I don't know. So, um, and then the person that I would most like, well, lunch. I mean. Uh, so that's dinner. Or that's that's dinner. That oh, that's fun. dinner. Okay. And lunch. You know, I gotta say, I don't go out to lunch. <laughs> I really don't do lunch. I've never, I never. I, I hate going out to lunch, so I really don't do lunch. So that's. A, I know that's a bit of a thought about. But I, I, there's really there. There's actually when I now look back through the um, you know my list of characters, there are very few that I would want to have any kind of meal with. But anyway. <laughs> Though I do, I would like to have. Well, you know what? Maybe I would change it. I would say Victor Ward. From Glamorama, maybe for dinner, would, for, uh, or for, for dinner and for lunch, <laughs> yeah. for a drink afterward. <laughs> I love Victor Ward. I hung out with him for eight years. Eight years I wrote about Victor Ward. You know, I couldn't get enough of the guy, and I felt terrible about what I put him through in the end. But I just uh, that that was that was well. That's a whole other thing. I mean, that's a book that I would never. Spend. I mean, eight years on a novel, eight that's years with a character time. like Victor Ward. That's a long time, but you know what? I take Tom right away, and I will say the 90s. Victor Ward. I Victor say Ward. Ward. Yeah. Victor Ward. Everybody. Um, okay. I will thank Brett now for being with us.